Hi there. So this is the very first lecture of unit four, which is about market structures. Um, and in this lecture, we're just going to kind of give you the big picture overview of all four different kinds of markets that actually exist. Um, and so the first one is perfect competition. Now, this one is the one that, that sort of kind of doesn't actually exist. I, I'm already backtracking on what I said. Um, but the perfect competition is the model that we've been operating under since the start of the semester. So there are all those little assumptions about many buyers and sellers and perfect information and all of those things. That was perfect competition. Um, we're going to use it in this kind of as our in this in this unit as dipping our toes into it. Um, and we'll get a little bit more of it and then we'll compare it to the other forms of markets that are all over the place in the real world. So um, let's get started. So the first thing to know about perfect competition is that there are many firms. Right. And we can actually say like thousands within a market area. Um, and, and we might add some examples here of like grain, you know, sold in silos out in the countryside and things like that. Um, grain in silos and farmers markets, which, you know, farmers markets are often given as the common example of a perfectly competitive market. Um, but they're not great because there aren't, you know, usually hundreds and hundreds of sellers. There's maybe, you know, 50 or so in one farmer's market. But but in theory, at least, they come as close as we're going to get here. Grain markets are one that actually approximates it fairly well as well. So um, monopolistic competition is the next one. And the, the other way that we distinguish them here is that these are many, but not as many as perfect competition. So we'd say, you know, in a given geographic area, maybe, you know, we're in the tens to maybe a hundred, um, and it, it kind of depends on what we're talking about here. But restaurants are a good example of them. Um, they, they're a great example, actually. Retail shops and grocery stores are also um, retail and grocery. And and so, you know, there might be within a given geographic area, like, like St. Louis, where I am, you know, we're thinking about there probably are four or five or six different grocery chains. Um, they're large enough that, that they kind of have different um, different um, goals there, and, and maybe they're in the 10s or 15s, actually. Um, oligopoly is where we're talking about few, few firms, and this would be two to eight. If you get past eight, then you're probably in a monopolistically competitive market, unless, you know, we're talking about 50 firms in the market, but only two of them actually are really the big players, right? If two, if two companies have 97% of the market, then it's an oligopoly. So you can see that these are kind of squishy definitions, right? You're, you know, we're, we're not really hard and fast rules on the numbers here, but anything more than eight big players in a market, you're probably not an oligopoly. Um, auto and airplane manufacturers are good ones. Um, examples. So there are really only two manufacturers of airplanes. Um, there's Boeing and there's Airbus. In the United States, there's really only a handful of companies that manufacture cars. Um, but we could also add to that, you know, the, the idea of cell phone service providers are a great example of an oligopoly. In the United States, there's, there's three. Um, there's T-Mobile, there's Verizon, and there's AT&T. And those are the three. Um, you know, in, in many areas, the oligopolies are also things like airline travel. You know, if you want to fly from one city to another, you're, you're pretty limited in the number of companies that will do that. So lots of examples of oligopolies, a, a pretty common uh, market structure. And the last one is monopoly, where there is one firm in the market. Um, and the most common example of that that we give are utility companies. So usually in one geographic area, you don't have more than one gas, natural gas company. You don't have more than one electric company, more than one um, telephone landline company. Um, although I, I don't even know, you know, folks who have landlines anymore, but, but utility companies, you know, a water company is, a, is another common example. So, um, so that's the first way that we kind of distinguish the different markets from each other. The second is how much control do the firms have over prices? And, and this is like, how much ability do they have to say, you know what, we're going to charge a higher price or, you know, we're going to, we're going to uh, cut the prices a little bit. Um, so we'd say that in perfect competition, the firms have none, they have no control. And for them, we call them price takers. They take the market price. And that's because there are so many firms that if any one of them were to raise its price, they would lose all their sales. Everybody would just go to the other sellers. They'd say, never mind, you know? And so they do, they produce the quantity at MR equals MC. They profit maximize there. And they find that the price is at the demand curve. 
So for the firm, right? So price and, and, and marginal revenue and demand are all the same thing for them, right? Mr. Dark, remember? So for a perfectly competitive firm, a price and their demand curve for their products and their marginal revenue are all the same thing. For a monopolistically competitive firm, it's close, but, but they have some differences that we're going to find in the graphs. For them, they have um, very little, you know, we'd say, you know, maybe some, and it kind of depends a little bit on what industry they're in, but there's some extent they can control the price. They still produce the quantity where MR equals MC, but for them, they find that the price is at the demand curve, not the marginal revenue. So this is an important distinction that for all of these other firms, and we'll just kind of lump these together here and say imperfect, imperfect competition. For all of them, the price is going to be on the firm's demand curve, but not on the firm's marginal revenue curve. So we are going to break Mr. DARP. We're going to just say DARP and Mr. and they're going to be separate from each other. For oligopolies, they have pretty major control over their prices. And again, we're going to look at more of what that means as we start to look into more of these, but they have pretty significant control. They produce at the quantity where MR equals MC. Are we noticing a pattern here? And they price at the demand curve, not marginal revenue. Um, but they also have, typically, they have interdependence. So I'm going to try to fit that word in here, interdependence. And it's okay if you can't quite fit it in there either. But it basically is this idea that I put in the box here, that their, their decision often is dependent upon what the other companies do, right? If Boeing decides it's gonna produce a great big new airplane, then Airbus is gonna to have to make a decision based on that because they are interdependent upon each other. So the prices they charge and the quantities they produce, although we can generally assume this is true, sometimes it's affected by the other party. Now the last one is complete or total, right, control. And they're limited only by the demand curve. So we call them price makers. They make the price. They say, this is the price. And so they still produce the quantity at MR equals MC, but their price is at the demand curve, not marginal revenue. And so that's, that's still, again, the constant in all of these. In all three of these imperfectly competitive ones, marginal revenue and price will not be the same thing anymore. We're, we're going to say goodbye to Mr. Dark when we deal with these three. Okay, now let's talk about the types of goods they produce, because that's another way that we can distinguish them. For perfectly competitive um, markets, they produce identical goods in perception and reality. So it's identical both in perception, perception, which means how people perceive the products, and reality. Now, there's an important implication of that. If everybody believes that all the products are the same, then there's no reason for any one individual firm to advertise. There, so you won't see advertising you know, in a grain silo because in fact, when the farmer comes into the grain silo, what they do is they say they measure the weight of it and they, they verify, yes, this is grain. And then they dump it into the grain silo and mix it in with everybody else's because it's all identical. It, it's identical both in perception and reality. So you'll never see people say, oh, my grain is better than somebody else's. It's like, you know, it's, it's an organic cucumber. It's at the farmer's market. They're not gonna like advertise. For monopolistic competition, they have differentiated goods. That's a fancy way of saying different ones, I think. Um, but they differentiate them. They're differentiated. And so they do things maybe like advertising to try to affect your per perception in perception and reality and or reality, right? Because it, it could also be that they might be exactly the same product, but they try to distinguish them in perception in some way. And so they'll sometimes do what we call non-price competition. So they'll offer maybe better customer service. A great example of that is it used to be you'd have this company called Sprint and this company called T-Mobile that did cell phone service. And they used exactly the same cell phone towers. If you made a phone call and it routed to one of their towers, they were the same towers. Um, so they didn't have any real difference in quality in terms of like the actual product, but they did advertise quite a bit because they would say, well, our customer service is better or, oh, you get these extra little benefits and perks, you know, and then things like that. And so that's one way that they compete a lot of times. Um, now, this is true for both oligopoly 
and for monopolistic competition. So that this is true for both. So I gave you the cell phone service example because they're an oligopoly. But restaurants will do the same thing too, right? They'll, they'll do that. You know, grocery stores will say, you know, come here or shop for service or whatever. For monopolies, they have unique goods. And we know that because if they weren't unique, if there were more than one company, then it wouldn't be a monopoly. So, so these are typically unique goods within a geographic area, right? I don't want a lot of questions being like, but Mr. Glossinger, the, the water company sells the water. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but it's within one geographic area. Okay, moving on, barriers to entry. This is saying how easy is it for a company to start up and how easy is it to exit? So sometimes we actually add barriers to entry and exit. And it's like, how easy is it for the company to start up and shut down? And we'd say that in a perfectly competitive market, a truly perfectly competitive one, there are none. And, and sometimes we call this friction. You know, we call it, we'd say, how hard is it, right, to start up a business? So we'd say all firms have kind of easy, easily enter and exit. And so they can instantaneously shut down if they want to. Um, they can instantaneously start right back up. We know that that's not true in like reality world, right? Grain silos, farmers, there's still some friction. Um, but at the same time, there's the perfectly competitive market is sometimes what we'd say like a theoretical ideal. There are no like perfectly competitive, truly perfectly competitive markets out there, um, but there are ones that approach it. And that's why I give you those examples. For monopolistic competition, there's going to be some barriers, but they're typically not insurmountable. Um, so we'd say that many firms enter, many firms enter and exit in the long run. So given enough time, firms will enter and exit in the long run. Now, for, for, um, for perfect competition, they can easily enter and exit in, even in the short run. It's like an instantaneous entry and exit. But for monopolistic competition, we'd say there's some startup costs. You know, there's regulations and things with running a restaurant or whatever. For oligopoly, there's moderate to high, right? Because it's quite difficult, actually, to start up a new aircraft company or a new car company and things like that. Think about it this way, you know, the, the one new car company really that's become successful in the last 80 years is Tesla, um, at least in the United States, right? So thinking about within a geographic area, there's very few new car companies. In fact, it's, it's quite difficult to start one. Um, and because of that, we'd say few enter or exit. And, and so there's quite high startup costs and quite high shutdown costs as well. Um, and we would say that it is very high barriers for a monopoly. And we'd say that even in the long run, firms rarely enter or exit. After all, think of the last time you heard someone say, you know what I want to do? I want to start up a new water company. That's because it's very difficult. It's regulated out. They can't. Um, and on top of that, even if you're losing money and you're a utility, in many cases, you have regulations that prohibit you from shutting down. Um, so it's so it's one of those kinds of situations. All right. So this gives you the big picture overview. In this unit, we're going to dive into the details of each one of these market structures. Hopefully this helped you. See you next time.